welcome to the world and failed. Were dreams weaved into stories into the night's canopy? As desk settles, find your sanctuary and breathe deeply, letting the day's echoes fade. Close your eyes and breathe tranquility, and let my voice guide you through mystical lands. Here, stories glow like stars, each tale a path to unknown wonders. As you drift on the bread of imagination, let go of the waking world. Let these narratives cradle you into a peaceful slumber where adventures await in the realm of dreams. Now, relax, listen, and let the journey unfold. Good night, and let the magic begin. Persephone's Rebellion Chapter 1 The Seeds of Rebellion In the shadowed depths of the underworld, where the storm's warm embrace could never reach, Queen Persephone dwelt in a palace of dark beauty. There a realm was one solemn grandeur, with amix columns and floors of shimmering obsidian. A profound sense of ennies began to take root in her heart. It was a feeling what had grown over countless cycles of the seasons above, a longing for the life she once knew. Filled with the caress of sunlight and the vibrant hues of gleaming flowers. Persephone's days were spent in the governance of the souls that wandered her domain. A duty she performed with a compassionate heart. Yet, each passing day saw her spirit wane, her once radiant smile dimming at the last light of dusk. She yearned for more than the perpetual twilight of her kingdom. She craved the verdant fields of her youth, the joy of life that teemed above. The seeds of rebellion were sown quietly, nurtured by whispered tales of the world above that reached even the deepest caverns of the underworld. These stories spoke of the world awakening from its winter slumber, of flowers daring to breach the snow's surface, heralding the return of spring. They ignited a fire within Persephone, a desire to break free from the chains that bound her to this eternal night. Her heart heavy with longing, Persephone roamed the shadowed groves and silver-lit gardens of her brow lost in thought. It was during one of these solitary walks that she encountered an unexpected visitor, an anim. Her form a shimmering, faithy, a lost wanderer from the world above. And the youth spoke of the beauty of the earth and of the rain of spring. Our fields awash with color and life of forests filled with the songs of birds. Each word painted a picture in Persephone's mind, a vision so vivid. It was almost painful. The contrast between the nymphed hotels and the monochrome reality of her surroundings deepened her unrest, fanning the flames of her nascent rebellion. The German to reclaim her connection to the living world and to bring the joy of spring back to the earth. Persephone knew she could no longer abide by the status quo. Those time for change time to charge the very foundations of the underworld. In the silence of her chambers, led only by the ethereal glow of phosphorus, mid plates, Persephone made a vow. She would aid a rebellion against Hades, against the fate that had been thrust upon her. She did fight for her freedom, for the return of spring, for the world to bloom once again on. This decision marked the beginning of her journey, a path fraught with challenges and uncertainties. 
that within Persephone, as heart burned a resolve, as unyielding as the oath itself. She would no longer be the queen of shadows. She would be the bringer of life, the herald of spring's triumphant return. As the first whispers of rebellion spread like a soft breeze through the underworld, a spark was ignited. It was the spark of hope, of change. The spark cup would grow in a blazing inferno, challenging the very reign of Hades himself. In the velvety cloak of an abinderoth night, beneath the ghostly luminescence of its eternal stars, Porsifone summoned the nymphs who had wandered into her realm. These ethereal beings, more accustomed to the dappled sunlight of forest glades, the lysandra shades of the netherworld, huddled in a secluded grove. Here, here, where the air was perfumed with the scent of silver-blooming asphodels, a secret conclave took place. Persephone, her presence commanding yet benevolent, addressed the gathering with a voice that melted sorrow with determination. She spoke of her lowing for the world above, her dreams of a land awakened from its winter slumber by the gentle hand of spring. Her words, imbued with the power of her divine heritage, styled the hearts of the nymphs. They too longed for the return to their natural hyperbots, for the caress of the breeze and the warmth of the sun. The queen proposed an alliance a pack sealed by shared desires and mutual benefit. In return for their aid in her uprising, Persephone promised the nymphs passage back to the surface and a role in the new order she sought to establish. Together, amid work to end the reign of eternal winter, imposed by her absence from the world above, to herald a time of her birth and growth, Moved by her plea, in the promise of returning to their beloved forests and streams, the nymphs pledged their support. They spoke of secret pathways rooting through the underworld, of hidden strengths and allies among its denizens. Their knowledge of the natural world of the cycles of life and death would be invaluable in the coming struggle. As the meeting can declare, the grove was alight with whispers of rebellion, of plans laid in the shadow of Hades, the dominion. Persephone of his heart, though heavy with the weight of her undertaking, was bullied by this newfound alliance. Though the nymphs at her side, she felt the stirrings of hope, a flicker of light in the endless dusk of her realm. Yet even as the conclave dispersed, Persephone was acutely aware of the challenges that lay ahead. Hades, lord of the underworld, was not a foot to be underestimated. His spies were many, his power immense. The path to freedom, to the revival of the world above, was fraught with peril. But the queen of the Enderworld was resolute. The seeds of rebellion, once sown, could not be unmade. The time for action was drawing near, as the stirrings of rebellion whispered through the dark corners of the Enderworld. And messenger arrived at Persephone, his palace. This was no ordinary envoy. It was a creature of the earth, molded from the very soy of the world above, sent by Demeter herself. Its form was both fearsome and awe-inspiring, embodying the dual nature of life's nurturing and destructive forces. The creature delivered its message in a voice that resonated like the deep rumblings of the earth. A voice that spoke of a mother's love, 
in an unyielding resolve. It was a prophecy from Demeter, a revelation that held the key to Persephone, Mr. Balas, and the restoration of balance between the realms of the living and the dead. The chains that bind thee are not of iron, but of fate, the earthy messenger intoned. To break them, thou must seek the heart of the underworld, where lies the sea of thine thine power. Holy brain bracing the fullness of thy dual nature, canst thou shatter the bounds of thy captivity and bring forth a spring eternal. The message was enigmatic, a puzzle wrapped in the mysteries of divine will. Yet within its words, Persephone found a glimmer of hope, a pathway to the freedom she so desperately sought. The prophecy spoke of a journey to the heart of the underworld, to a place of great power and danger, where she would find the means to assert her will against the dominion that Hades. Empowered by her mother's wisdom, Persephone, resolved to undertake this perilous quest. She understood that the journey would test her strength and resolve, that she would face trials both physical and spiritual. At the promise of breaking her chains and returning the world to a state balance and renewal fueled her determination. With the prophecy as her guide, Persephone began to prepare for the journey ahead. She gathered her allies and the spirits who had pledged themselves to her cause and shared with them the words of Demeter. Together, they would embark on this quest, facing whatever dangers lay in wait, united in their purpose to defy the will of Hades and bring about a change that would echo through the ages. As the preparations for the journey began, a sense of anticipation fell be there. The prophecy had set in motion events that could not be end in, and the fate of the underworld and of the world above hung in the balance. Persephron is still at the threshold of a great undertaking, her heart both heavy and hopeful. The path to freedom was laid before her, fraught with challenges, but illuminated by the promise of a new dawn with the prophecy of Demeter echoing in her heart. Persephone turned her gaze towards the shadow reaches of her domain, where forgotten spirits and ancient entities dwelt. These were the souls and beings who had over young weary of Hades unyielding rule. Their desires for change smooth to him like embers in the dark. One of them were spirits of valorous heroes whose names had been lost to time, and signed to the underworld yet burning with an undiminished fire for honor and valor. Was there also ancient entities, primordial gods who predated the Olympians? Their powers diminished, but their wisdom vast. But these potential allies, Persephone extended her hand, seeking their strength and counsel in her quest for liberation. Her first ally came from the shadows, a hero of old. His spirit is fierce as the battles he once waged. I pledge my sword to your cause, he declared, his voice echoing with the strength of Bye buying here is. For too long have I dwelt in these shadows, yearning for a purpose worthy of my legacy. Next, from the depths of a forgotten temple, emerged an ancient deity, a form both wondrous and terrifying. Why am of the earth and the stars, she intoned. Her voice a whisper of wind the rumble of the earth. In your quest, I see the echo of battles I once fought. I will lend you my power, that we may reshape the order of things. Or it of Kosefrunstri spread through the underworld of a rising tide. 
reaching the ears of many who had long harbored dreams of change. Spirits of nature, once guardians of sacred groves and rivers, now bound to the realm of shadows, came forth to pitch their allegiance. Even the lesser gods, those who tended the flickering flames of the underworld as forges and guided the silent bones upon the sticks, found a new purpose in her rebellion. Together, they formed an unlikely coalition, bound by a shared vision of a world reborn, of chains broken and balance restored. Persephone, with her newfound allies, began to weave a tapestry of rebellion, each stride representing a promise of change, a vow of defiance against the tyranny of Hades, as they gathered in secret beneath the watchful eyes of the fates. Strategies were forged and plans laid. They spoke of the heart of the interworld, the place where Parsifal's power could be unlocked, and of the challenges they would face and reaching it. They talked of Hades, legions, of the spanners and phantoms that guarded his realm, and of the cunning and strength required to overcome them. In these meetings, a spirit of camaraderie blossomed, a unity forged in a crucible of shared purpose. Prusithan stood at the center of this burgeoning alliance, her resolve unwavering, her vision clear. She was no longer the queen of a realm she had been forced to accept. She was a leader, a beacon of hope, for all you yearned for freedom and renewal, in the heart of the underworld, under the conk of an eternal twilight, the spark of rebellion and nindering into a flame. The act that set the underworld ablaze with whispers of insurrection was bold and fraught with danger. Yet it was a weight of Parsifrance, unyielding desire for freedom and renewal, and was at the confluence of the five rivers of the Emberworld, a place where the souls of the departed may hold, that Persephone, there where the waters of Leth, Archeron, Styx, Flagithlon, and Tad, led is met, she planted a garden. That this was no ordinary garden, it was a sanctuary of life in the heart of death, a testament to her power and her claim to both realms. With the aid of her allies, Persephone called, forcing the essence of spring, coaxing flowers to bloom amidst the ashen soil, their colors vibrant against the monochrome shades of the mother world. The air, usually still, and laden with the weight of silence, was filled with the fragrance of blossoms and the soft murmur of life. Word of this miraculous guidance spiked like wildfires through the underworld, drawing the attention of its denizens. Spirits long resigned to their fate came forth, drawn by the beauty and the promise it represented. Even the most hardened of Hades' minions could not help but pause, touched by a spectacle they had never imagined possible. This garden was Persephone's declaration, a challenge to Hades, a rule and a symbol of her claim to the throne not as a queen of the dead, but as a bringer of life. It was her way of showing that the underworld, domain of shadows and sorrow, could be a place of growth and a nigel, just as she could be its mura and its netsnit <laughs> Hades, upon learning of Arsephon's act, was consumed with a fury that shook the foundations of the underworld. The garden in its defiance threatened not just his rule, but the very order of the cosmos, challenging the division 
between Yef and Tef that had governed the world since time immemorial. Yet, for all his power, Hades found himself at a crossroads. To destroy that garden would be to declare war against Persephone and her allies who would acknowledge her challenge and face the consequences of their rebellion. But to allow it to remain would be to admit to his own powerlessness to accept the seeds of change that Persephone had sown. The garden stood, therefore, not just as a beacon of hope for those who yearn for freedom, but as the spark that ignited the flame of rebellion. It marked the end of whispers and shadows, the beginning of open defiance against the tyranny of the underworld. Skin. The underworld teetered in the brink of upheaval. Persephone, to her eyes, marshaled their forces, stealing themselves for the battle that lay ahead. The garden had gone reverish in that vivid declaration of her intent had drawn a line that could not be unmarked. Aedes' wrath was assured, his retribution inevitable. Yet, in the face of this looming storm, a resolve as firm as the earth itself took root among those who stood with Persephone. In the shadow of rams and forgotten places of the underworld, they gathered vast spirits of ancient warriors, nymphs of shadow groves, entities born of primordial might and gods of old. But power stinged but nigh Each brought their strength to bear, forging a coalition as diverse as the realms of the living and the dead. Parsifon, at the heart of this alliance, emerged as a leader whose authority was born of both her divine heritage and the righteousness of her cause with Demeter. As prophecy is her guide, she laid out their strategy, her voice echoing in the cavernous expanse where her forces assembled. A battle, she proclaimed, lies not merely for dominion in for these shadowed lands. It is a fight for bonds for the renewal of life, for the cycle of seasons that sustains the world above. We stand at the precipice of change, and from this darkness we will bring foot light. Here preparations were multifaceted, as complex as the web of fate woven by the Moirai themselves. Warriors trained in the art of celestial combat, homing skills that could turn the tide of battle against the legions of the dead. Nymphs and nature spirits wove on amendments of growth and renewal, infusing the rebels with the resilience of the earth. The ancient gods and their wisdom and their might, crafting artifacts of power to bait the chains of fate that bound Persephone to the underworld and secret forges beneath the gaze of Hephaestus. Weapons were wrought not of iron, but of a sinning. Swords that could capture the shadows, shields to uphold the studs, the studs, the studs, the studs, and at the heart of their encampment, the garden gloomed, a reminder of what they fought forth, a want reborn, and balance restored. Meanwhile, Hayes, lord of the underworld, mustered his own formidable might. From the deepest dungeons and the darkest pits, he called forth creatures of nightmare, spiders of despair, and phantoms of terror. The very air of the Kinderwood thickened with the power of his summoning, the atmosphere charged with the anticipation of conflict. Thus the two forces prepared for war. 
the underworld became a realm divided, a chessboard upon which the fate of all would be decided. At stake was not just the rule of this dark domain, but the very nature of existence itself. Would the underway remain a place of eternal sorrow, or could it be transformed into a realm of passage? <sighs> A gate between life and death thought honored both. Perceptful. Standing before her assembled allies on the eve of battle, looked upon the faces of those who had chosen to stand with her. In the eyes, she saw in not just stupines, but chop. A hope for a future where the cycles of life and death were respected and cherished while the underworld was part of the great tapestry of existence, now the tentatis all, she found, only fight not just for our freedom, but for the soul of the world. Together we will face the guardless, infirmate we will bring forth. Mind subtle, as the first beginners of the eternal twilight begin to fade, her piss bag darkness that seemed to swirl all to ourselves. The battle for the underworld, for spring's return to the world above, was about to begin. Chapter 2 The Clash of Wills As the shroud of night enfolded, the underworld in its silent embrace, Crucifonless forces emerged through shadows, their resolve shining like stars in the darkness. The air dreamed with the power of their unity, a palpable force that surged towards the Hall of Hades. Dominion, his formidable palace, a fortress of obsidian, in despair, with a Neodos Boris. The rebels and assembly of ancient heroes, spirits of nature, and forgotten gods moved for the purpose that disturbed the eternal stillness of the underworld. At their forefront, Persephone rode, her figure cloaked in the Vridang scythe, a stark contrast to the deathly hues of her realm. Her eyes, once pools of serene darkness, now blazed with the fire of rebellion. The first clash came at the gates of Hades, guarded by phantoms and these spawned from the deepest fears of mankind. The air crackled with the clash of ethereal weapons and the roar of battle cries as Persephone's forces engaged the defenders with a fury that matched the raging of the titans. The ancient heroes, their skills home, though the wars of old, lead the charge, cutting through the spectral defenders with blades that gleamed with celestial fire. And nymphs and nature spirits move spells of growth and decay, turning the very ground against the palace's guardians. Vines elected from the cracks of the underworld and snaring phantoms, as flowers blinked with a brilliance that blinded those who dared oppose them. At the heart of the battle, Persephone herself faced the might of Hades. Most fierce minions, with each swing of her arm, she summoned the power of life and death. A duality that she re it with a mastery unmatched. Her anger, the ancient entities unleashed their forgotten powers, shaping the ether that the anonymates to their will, challenging the very fabric of the Enderar, the defenses of Hades, Hellas. For all that bred power began to falter under the relentless assault. The gates, wrought from the bonds of titans and sealed with the curses of the thousand witches, shattered and ground as the forces of life assailed them. 
With the final, concerted effort, the rebels reached the defenses, their victory cry echoing through the halls of the dead. That this was but the first battle in a war that would decide the fate of the underworld. The palace of Hades, a labyrinth of shadows and despair, awaited them, its master still hidden within its deepest sanctum. The rebels pushed forward, their spirits alight with the fires of hope and defiance, determined to confront Hades himself and his reign of darkness. The air within the palace was heavy with the anticipation of the confrontation to come. Hades, Lord of the Underworld, had awaited this moment. His power gathered about him like a storm on the horizon. The clash of wheels between the Queen of Rebirth and the Kin of Death was imminent. A hell that would echo through the ages a testament to the unyielding spirit of rebelling. Binding them that on them to the palm to the palm thing. As Persephone's forces penetrated the heart of the palace, the very air seemed to pulse with the tension of the impending clash. This was the moment of truth, the fulcrum upon which the future of the underworld would pivot. The first strike had been launched, the battle joined, and the course of destiny now hung in the balance, inviting the outcome of the clash of wills. The breach of his palace's gates, a fortress and a silent for youngs, ignited a fury in Hades that had not been roused since the Titanomachy. The lord of the underworld has visited a mask of wrath, sculpted from the very essence of the abyss, stood at the heart of his domain. The shock of Persephone's rebellion, the audacity of the attack, fanned the flames of his anger, transforming it into a tempest that threatened to engulf the rebels in its wake. Hades, whose command over the dead, and the damned was absolute, summoned the full might of his realm. The ground Zurich at the rivers of the underworld surged and the air crackled with the power of his summoning. From the darkest corners of his domain, from the deepest pits and the most forsaken dungeons, came creatures of nightmare and despair. Each a testament to Hades, and he got its The palace itself seemed to respond to its master's rage, its halls twisting, expanding, becoming a labyrinth designed to trap and disorient intruders. Walls of dawn emerged from the ground, blocking paths and separating the rebels from one another. All phantoms born of the deepest fears of mankind stalked the shadows, the whispers sowing discord and terror. Amidst this chaos, Hades himself strove into battle. A figure of dark majesty. His helmet, the helm of darkness, rendered him a wraith, unseen yet omnipresent, as he unleashed his counterattack. The very air turned heavy, a miasma of despair that sought to crush the spirits of the rebels, to remind them of the futility of their cause. The first to fear the brint of Hades. Wrath were the ancient heroes, their martial prowess unmatched. Yet now facing foes that were neither truly alive or dead. They fought valiantly, their blades bavine through shadows. But for every spectre felt, two more seemed to take its place, a never-ending tide of the damned. The nature spirit so vital in breaching the palace gates found their powers waning, their spells unraveling under the oppressive might of Hades' domain. The very essence of the Endworld resisted their efforts, a testament to the Lord's control over his realm. Yet, 
that was the ancient Thentites, the gods of all to cast their lot with Prusiphon, who faced the greatest challenge. Aesir in his fury had called upon the ancient pacts and curses that bound these beings, using their own oaths against them. They battled not just Hades' minions, but their own shackles, fighting to overcome the limitations that diminished their powers eons ago. Amidst this turmoil, Persephone stood as a beacon of resilience. Though the forces arrayed against her seemed insurmountable, her resolve did not waver. With every setback, her determination grew, her powers of life and renewal shining as a light in the darkness. Around her, the rebels rallied, drawing strength from her unwavering spirit. The battle raged on, the palace of Hades a crucible within which the fate of the Enderworld was being forged. With each passing moment, the conflict escalated, reaching the crescendo of violence and power that threatened to unravel the very fabric of the realm. Hades' narrow retaliation had transformed the rebellion into a struggle for survival. A test of entrance, blew against the seemingly invincible might of the Lord of the Dead. An underworld trembled under the weight of their clash, a domain divided against itself, its future hanging in the balance. As the battle wore on, it became clear that this was but the opening salvo in a war that would decide the destiny of gods and mortals alike. The stakes were nothing less than the nature of existence itself, a contest of wills between the unyielding lord of the Enderworld and the queen who sought to usher in a new era of balance and renewal. A rebellious path, once marked by the hope of renewal and the promise of spring, now led to the banks of the Styx, a river that binds the Indian world with its solemn vow. Air where the waters whispered of oaths and broken and curses eternal, the forces of Porcifon and Haiti clashed in a battle that would mark the annals of myth and memory. For river stakes, its dark waters a mirror to the souls it carried became the stage for a confrontation of epic proportions. The Rebois, buoyed by the righteousness of their cause, met the legions of Hades. Creatures forged from the very essence of the Underworks, despair and darkness. It was here, at this somber threshold, that the true cost of rebellion was laid bare. A testament to the lengths to which gods and spirits would go to achieve victory. Persephone, radiant even in the heart of battle, led her forces with a grace that belied the ferocity of her resolve. Her connection to the living world, to the cycle of seasons, lent her strength, a vivid contrast to the shadowed might of Hades. Around her, the rebels fought with a valor that shone brightly against the backdrop of the sticks. Their sacrifices illuminating the darkness of the underworld. Hades, in his chariot drawn by shadowed steeds, was a figure of dread majesty. Each command he issued, each strike he dealt, was imbued with the weight of his sovereignty his determination to quell the rebellion and maintain his dominion absolute. The waters of the sticks churned in fraught, as if in response to the clash of wills above its surface. The spirits within its depths crying out for an end to the conflict. The battle raged, neither side yielding, the air filled with the clash of celestial steel and the cries of the fallen. The banks of the Styx bore witness to acts of heroism and sacrifice, 
as rebels or minions alike were swept away by the river's remorseless flow. Their thoughts for fond and death. Among the chaos, a moment of tragic valor emerged. A hero of all whose name had been whispered in tales of yore stepped forth to challenge the might of Hades directly. His blade, alike with the fire of the stars, struck true, piercing the darkness that surrounded the Lord of the Dead, but the victory was fleeting. With a gesture of terrible power, Hades struck him down, his fall a somber note in the symphony of battle. His loss, grievous and profound, became a rallying cry for Persephone's forces. The fallen hero, a symbol of their struggle, inspired a renewed fervor among the rebels. They pressed forward, their determination hardened by the sacrifice of their comrade, each aware of the stakes for which they fought. The battle of the sticks, though, but one chapter in the saga of rebellion demonstrated the fundamental spirit of the seek change who challenged the first destiny for thinking. Both sides suffered heavy losses. The waters of the Styx is solid testament to the lives give them in pursuit of their cause. With the battle waned, with both forces weary and diminished, the river itself seemed to sigh, its dark white is carrying away the remnants of the day's conflict. The outcome, though indecisive, had changed the course of the rebellion, embedding the conflict deep within the heart of the underworld. This battle, with its heroism and its heartbreak, underscored the immutable truth of rebellion. But the journey towards change is fraught with loss, but also of the potential for transformation. The Persephone, the Battle of the Styx, was both a somber reminder of the cost of her cause and a beacon of hope, a testament to the resilience of those who stand at her side. In the wither of the Battle of the Styx, as the underworld licked its wounds and the rebels mourned their fallen, a new force stirred. The power so immense that it sent ripples through the fabric of the realm. Demeter, goddess of the harvest and mother to Persephone, could no longer stand idle. Her daughter's rebellion calling forth a primal, divine fury that had slumbered within her. Her descent into the underworld was a spectacle that none could ignore. Swathed in the verdure of life, her presence was a stark defiance against the realm of death. The very air around her pulsed with the power of growth and renewal, a testament to her dominion of how the cycle of life. Dinar, in how wrath sought modernly her daughter, the vengeance against Hades for the strife he had brought upon her child. A moment Demeter set foot in the underworld. The balance of power shifted. The arc trailed, not with the quaking of fear, but with the stirrings of life, as if responding to the will of its mistress. Flowers bloomed in the ashen soil. Vines crept along the barren rocks, and the air grew warm with the breath of summer. Her revival heralded a change, a new dawn that pierced the eternal night of the Enderworld. The Hades losses, already wearied from their clash at the sticks, found themselves full prepared for the fury of a goddess. Demeter and wrath was indiscriminate, her power sweeping through the ranks of the dagger and the dam like a storm of defying retribution. There went stood spitzers and phantoms, now grew thickets and groves, the land reclaimed by the force of life. 
The Tadasus power fled her to the heart of the conflict, where Persephone and her rebels faced the relentless might of Hades' legions. With a cry that melded grief with rage, Demeter joined the fray, her every gesture bringing forth the might of the earth. Veins ensnared the enquiry, the ground swallowed whole units of Hades' army, and the very air thrown with the power of her sorrow and anger. But it was now merely the physical might of Demeter that turned the tide, her presence a testament to the unbreakable bond between mother and daughter infused the rebels with renewed vigor. They fought not just for the freedom of the older world, but for the sanctity of family, for the love that bound them to their cause. Hades, confronted with the fury of Demeter, found his own power waning. The lord of the older world, for all his dominion over death, could not stem the tide of life unleashed by the goddess. His attempts to rally his forces faltered. The spiders of his army withering before Demeter's onslaught, their essence reclaimed by the cycle they had sought to escape. The battle, though fierce, was swift. Demeter and his arrival, her divine lead unleashed upon the underworld, shifted balance irrevocably. Hades, faced with the combined might of mother and daughter, saw his hold over the realm of the dead challenged as never before. In the aftermath, as the echoes of conflict faded, the underworld was transformed where death had once reigned supreme. Now pockets of life flourished, a testament to the rebellion and to Demeter of his fury. The goddess her wrath abated. Buddha, we resolve on Dim, stood beside her daughter, a united front against the darkness. Her intervention marks a turning point in the saga of Persephone Ben's rebellion. No longer was it a mere struggle for the freedom of one goddess or the fate of the underworld. It had become a battle for the very essence of existence, a fight to restore balance between life and death, a war that would define the destiny of gods and mortals alike. The intervention of Demeter her divine wrath unleashed upon the legions of Hades marked not just a shift in the balance of power, but a turn of the tide in the hearts of the underworld, its denizens. The realms of shadow and despair, long resigned to the immutable rule of their dark lord, now bore witness to the resurgence of life and hope. Persephone, this rebellion, once a flickling flame in the oppressive darkness was now a beacon, drawing forth allies from the unfootliest of places. In the aftermath of Demeter's fury, as the echoes of her power still resonated through the halls and caverns of the underworld, a remarkable transformation took place. Spirits that had wandered the realm, bound by chains of regret and sorrow, began to rally to Persephone's cause. They saw in her not just a queen of the dead, but a harbinger of renewal, a promise of liberation from the eternal cycle of despair. Creatures born of the underworld's essence, entities that had lit on the light of day nor the warmth of spring were touched by the rebellion's vision. They witnessed the growth offered in life amidst the ashen wastes, the bloom of flowers when men should grow. Then they understood. For suffering, this cause was not an affront to their existence, but a chance for rebirth. An opportunity to be part of a world where light balanced the darkness, where life danced with death in an eternal cycle. Among these new allies were the shades of heroes long forgotten, their deeds lost in the midst of time. 
These spectral warriors, inspired by the valor of the fallen hero of the Styx and invigorated by the presence of Demeter, found a new cause to fight for. They joined the rebels. The ethereal blades now wielded in the name of balance and renewal. Even the lesser gods of the underworld, those who attended the rivers, the caverns, and the silent fiends of Pasphodel, saw Persephone's belly in a chance for change. These deities, Arvel yet can undervalue, recognized in the queens, quest a reflection of their own desires for recognition and purpose. They lent their powers to the cause, their subtle magis, and in them knowledge of the underwall, as secrets becoming invaluable assets in the struggle against Hades. As the tide turned, the momentum of the rebellion grew. The disparate forces of the underworld, united under Persephone's banner, began to push back against Hades, dominion with her new vigor. Where before there was resignation, now there was resistance. Now there was despair. Now there was determination. The underworld itself seemed to respond to this shift in the winds of fate. So the reefers flowed with a purpose, the caverns echoed with the whispers of hope, and eating the air long stale with the breath of the dead carried the scent of impending change. Hades, watching from his dark throne, saw the tide turning against him. The loyalty of his realm, once unassailable, now wavered as the promise of a Nien beginning to root in the hearts of his subjects. The Lord of the Dead faced a rebellion that had grown beyond a mere challenge to his hell. It was now a challenge to their nature of his realm, a threat to the eternal night by the burgeoning dawn of Inamira. The turning tide of the rebellion marked a pivotal moment in the saga of the underworld. With Demetrius' intervention and a rallying of the cream with spirits and gods to Persephone, its cause, the Rodalian was no longer a distant dream, but a tangible force poised to challenge the dark Jedi light and shadow the Lestatons. The stage was set for the final confrontation. A battle felt to decide the fate of the underworld. And a cycle of seasons above, a rebellion with its newfound allies and its vision of renewal stood ready to face the might of Hades, to bring about the dying of a new era. Rur perish in the attempt, and the thrills of rebellion where every victory is shadowed by loss and every triumph tinged with sacrifice, a singular moment of heartbreak can ignite the fiercest resolve. Such was the case when tragedy struck at the heart of Persephone's uprising, a loss so profound would forever mark the soul of the rebellion. Among the ranks of Persephone, his allies was a figure of unmatched valor, a hero whose steeds had begun to weave the fabric of legend even before the fateful day. This hero, a champion of the oppressed, a beacon of hope, had stood by Persephone, sighed through the darkest hours, their sword raised high against the tyranny of Hades. In battle, they were invincible, a whirlwind of celestial might and earthly cunning. But in war, even the mightiest can fall. It was during a critical skirmish when that aimed to secure a strategic advantage against Hades' forces that the unthinkable happened. The hero, leading a charge against a bastion of the Underworld's Lord, was met by Hades himself. The clash was titanic, a spectacle, a divine power, 
and mortal bravery that would be sung by the shades of the underworld for eons to come. But fate, ever capricious, dealt its cruel blow. A hero in a moment of unmatched bravery struck a blow that pierced the veil of Bidis. Now, but Figma and Shenanigan. Yet, in doing so, they exposed themselves to the untouched of Death's master, Hades, with the power born of his ancient Aminion, and leashed his fury upon the hero, a blow of no mortal frame, no matter how divine, could withstand. The hero fell, their light extinguished in the somber depths of the Thunder world. Around them, the battle raged on. But the moment of their passing marked a turning point. The rebellion, so infused with the vigor and hope that the hero had embodied, felt the shadow of despair loom large. Yet, from the depths of this despair, a new resolve was kindled. The hero's sacrifice became a rallying cry for Persephone's forces. They became a symbol not of defeat, but of the item price of freedom, of the sacrifices demanded by the pursuit of change. The hero's fall galvanized the spirits and gods of the underworld, binding them together in a shared purpose stronger than the bonds of fate. Persephone, her heart heavy with grief, transformed her sorrow into strength. In the face of this tragic loss, she found a deeper wellspring of resolve. The hero's mene became a beacon, guiding the rebellion forward, their story told and retold, a legend that stirred the hearts of all who heard it. Rebellion's ranks swelled as creatures and spirits of the underworld, moved by the hero's story, joined the cause. No martyrdom could achieve what Loy Jinan could not. Martyred the disparate denizens of the realm in a common cause, enduring them with a sense of purpose and a determination to see this struggle through into its end. The Zerberum Prestine, the shadow of the fallen hero loomed large, a reminder of the cost of their fight. Also, of the indomitable spirit of those who dared to challenge the darkness. In the hearts of Persepison, his followers, a hero lived on, their sacrifice a testament to the power of courage, a strait of resolve, and the unyielding pursuit of freedom and change. The loss of the hero, while a moment of profound sorrow, became the bedrock upon which the rebellion's resolve was fortified. In their memory, the forces of renewal pressed forward. Their spirits buoyed by the belief that from the greatest sacrifices, the most enduring victories are born. The rebellion, now more than ever, was a crusade not just for the freedom of the underworld, but for the honor of the fallen. A quest to ensure that their sacrifice would herald the dawn of a new era. Chapter 3 in The Dawn of Spring The rebellion fueled by the sacrifices of its heroes and the unity of its cause had led to this moment. The final confrontation between Persephone and Hades. Underworld, a realm accustomed to the silence of resignation and the stillness of despair now pulsed with the tension of impending change. The very air seemed to hold its breath, awaiting the clash I would decide its fate. Persephone, 
standing at the forefront of her assembled forces, was a vision of resolve and power. She bore not just the mantle of rebellion, but the harp of renewal, the promise of a balance restored. Her presence fervanized her allies, their spirits alight with the possibility of a new beginning, their hearts heavy with the memory of those lost. Hades, love the underworld, awaited her challenge upon his throne of obsidian, his countenance a scuddy in dark majesty. Round him swirled the ascending minion and despair, the powers he had wielded, unchallenged freons. Yet in his eyes, he figured a shadow of uncertainty, a testament to the depth of the rebellion's reach. The clash began not with a clanging of swords or the thunder of gods, but with a dialogue, a final exchange between two beings bound by fate, yet divided by vision, Persephone, with the eloquence of spring's first thaw, voiced the grievances of the oppressed, the longing for freedom, and the necessity of change. Hades, with the gravitas of endless winter, spoke of order, of the inevitability of death and sanctity of his rule. But words, however powerful, could not bridge the chasm between them. The conflict long simmering erupted with a force that shook the foundations of the underworld. So she form unleashed the full might of her divinity, her powers, all her life and rebirth colliding with the dark energies of Hades. The air cycled with the clash of their wills, the ground trembled beneath their fury, and the rivers of the underworld surged and twisted, echoing the tumult above. The battle was a spectacle of divine might, a struggle that transcended the physical to touch the very essence of existence. Around them, the forces of rebellion and dominion clashed, their fates intertwined with the outcome of their leader's duel. Persephone, with every blow struck and every spell woven, chant of the essence of growth, of cycles that bring life from death, of winter's end and spring's beginning. Her vision for the underworld, a realm not of punishment, but of endings that nod to beginnings, infuse her with a radiant strength. Hades, in turn, weeded the powers of death and decay of endings that are final and the weight of judgment. Yet, in his resistance, there was a recognition of Persephone's resolve of the change she embodied, a change that even he could not deny. The clash reached its zenith, a moment suspended in eternity, where the outcome unbalanced on the edge of a knife. In that instant, Persephone and Hades, goddess of spring and lord of the dead, transcended their thinity. They became the embodiment of life cycle, the eternal dance between light and shadow, growth and decay, renewal and rest. With a final act of will, Persephone broke through Hades' defenses, her powers touching the heart of the end world, seeing it with the promise of change. The impact of their confrontation resonated through the realm, reshaping its very fabric. Where there had been only desolation, now there were strains of life. Whether it meant silence, now there were murmurs of growth. The battle ended not with the defeat of Hades, but with an acknowledgement of necessity of the balance between mere domains. The underworld forever changed would now be a place where souls could find rest and rebirth, 
where the cycle of life and death was respected and honored. Persephone's rebellion, culminating in this last stand, had achieved its purpose. The dawn of spring, both above and below, heralded a new era for the Enderwall. A well were born from the depths of winter's embrace, a testament to the enduring power of hope, in the unyielding stibs build spint build In the aftermath, the octomoth of the monumental clash, as the dust settled in the echoes of their battle, faded into the somber halls of the underworld. A profound silence enveloped the realm. It was in this stillness, under the gaze of countless souls, in the watchful eyes of gods and spirits alike, that Persephone approached the final barrier to her freedom and the fulfillment of her vision. That she instead bowed Persephone to Hades, and the underworld were not mere physical shackles, but bonds forged from the ancient laws of gods through fate. Mace shadows. To break them was to challenge the very foundations of divine order, to assert her little against the predetermined fate of the cosmos. With the resolve that it carried her thither rebellion, Persithon reached deep within herself, to the core of her being where divine essence and mortal compassion intertwined. There, she finds the strength to confront the final vestige of her captivity, drawing upon the collective hope of her allies, the lessons of sacrifice and unity learned through their struggle. In the untapped potential of her own godhood, Persephon called for it the power to sever the chains that bound her. A moment Persephone acted to break these ethereal bonds, the underworld itself seemed to hold its breath. A surge of energy, radiant and warm, cascaded from her, illuminating the dark corners of the realm. The chains, manifestations of ancient accords, and the weight of Hades, dominion, began to dissolve under the intensity of her light. And Anne reveled not with violence, but with the grace of falling petals, a symbolic release from the old constraints and a heralding of new beginnings. Hades, led to sing this act, saw not the defiance of his rule, but the emergence of a new order. In Persephone, thy determination, he recognized the inevitability of change, the shifting of seasons that his realm had long been denied. The breaking of the chains was not a loss, and a transformation an enlargement that the Vendor world, like the earth above, was part of the eternal cycle of life and death, growth, and decay. This act of liberation resonated through the underworld, a clear, bright note that signaled the dawn of a new era. For the spirits and deities of the realm, it was a sign that their world was no longer a place of endless night, but a domain where light could find a foothold, where the cycle that the seasons could flow unimpeded. Persephone, in breaking her chains, had also loosened the bonds that had held the underworld in stasis, inviting the possibility of renewal and rebirth into its depths. The significance of this moment extended beyond the borders of the underworld, reaching the farthest corner of creation. It was a testament to the power of will, the strength of conviction, and the courage to seek change in the face of ancient traditions and seemingly insurmountable odds. As the chains dissipated, Persephone stood transformed. No longer the reluctant queen of the dead, she was now a symbol of balance, mediator between life and death, grief and rest. She had achieved not just her own freedom, but had opened the path 
to the underworld to become a realm of passage, a place where souls could transition, reflecting the beauty of life's incrementals and the promise of Romano. In this act of breaking the chains, Persephone set the stage for the underworld this integration into the cycle of the seasons, for the blossoming of life where none had been thought possible. It was a declaration of her independence and her commitment to the balance of the cosmos, a balance that embraced both the light of life and the solemn beauty of death. With the chains of old broken and the tyranny of an unchanging fate overthrown, the underworld stood on the precipice of a new dawn. Gloel, wrong, shrouded in the stillness of perpetual gloom, began to stir with the promise of renewal. This drives her nation, on for Bishopkum, Dijing, and her own. I'm the ending here over the underworld where it's no longer a prison of shadows, but a realm of passage, of the faction in the night governs all double life. The change was gradual yet undeniable, for once there had been only barren plains and desolate fields, now meadows of past fertile bloomed with ethereal light, their beauty abound to the souls of the departed. Reveries whose waters had once whispered of forgetfulness and despair, now sang of memories cherished and the hope of renewal. A very air once heavy with the weight of eternity was now filled with the subtle fragrance of spring, a reminder of the world above, whose cycles it shared with the world below. This rebirth of the underworld was not merely a physical transformation but a spiritual one. Sours, what had wandered its depths, lost and forlorn, now found a purpose in their passage. They were guided not by the cold, unfeying hand of fate, but by the compassionate embrace of Kursifon and the other allies, who offered solace and understanding. The underworld, in its new guise, became a place why the joy of the soul was honored, a passage that mirrored the transitions of life itself. Hades, far from being a defeated foe, became a medieval part of this new order. His power, once feared as the ultimate end, was now respected as a necessary phase of transition. Together with Persephone, he presided over the Enderworld, not as its tyrant, but as its guardian, ensuring that the balance between life and death was maintained. This partnership, forged from the trials of rebellion and the fires of change, stood as a testament to the possibility of harmony between opposing forces. The deities and spirits of the Enderwald, witnessing this transformation, found their roles within the realm we defined. They became caretakers of the souls in their passage, guides who either the departed to vine meadows of renewal along the rivers of reflection. Their existence, once a testament to the unyielding grip of death, was now being built with the purpose of facilitating rebirth and growth. The rebirth of the underworld resonated beyond its borders. Its effects felt in the cycle of seasons, in the ebb and flow of life on the earth above. Spring, Persephone's season, flourished with newfound vigor, its beauty a reflection of the balance achieved in the depths below. The world of the living, in turn, became more attuned to the rhythms of nature, to the cycles of growth and rest that govern all existence. This transformation of the end of world into a realm of passage, where the journey of the soul was celebrated as part of the great cycle, was Persephone's greatest triumph. It was a victory not of conquest, or of understanding, 
a realization of her vision, a life and death were non adversaries, but partners in the eternal dance of existence. The then new womb were born from the ashes of the old order, stood as a beacon of hope and a reminder of the indomitable spirit of those who seek change. It was a realm transformed, not just an landscape, but in essence, a domain where the darkness of death is balanced by the light of rebirth, or every bending is of decay and charity. In this new era, the underworld was a piece of passage, a realm that in its depths held the promise of spring's eternal return. In the wake of the underworld is transformation, a moment of profound significance approach. A moment heralded by the stirrings of life beneath the frozen mantle of Rinter's domain. It was the time of Persephone, ascension to the surface, a journey that symbolized our near return, of the very essence of renewal and the cyclical nature of existence. As she prepared to leave the realm she had reshaped, the underworld itself seemed to pause, its myriad inhabitants watching with a bittersweet mixture of joy and sorrow. Porsfon, this ascent was not a solitary affair. It was accompanied by a cavalcade of spirits and deities, a procession that celebrated the balance she had achieved between the realms of life and death. As she moved towards the surface, the boundary that separated the underworld from a world above seemed to thin, the division between them no longer a barrier but a bridge. The moon Persephone emerged into the light of the sun. The earth responded as of awakening from a long slumber. Across the landscapes of the world, from the valley shrouded in mist to the ancient forests, and the wild meadows, a wave of growth and renewal spread like wildfire. Flowers bloomed in riotous colors painting the earth with the hues of life, their fragrance and testament to the queen's return. Trees that had stood silent and bare through the winter months and burst into verdant life, their leaves unfurling like banners, the heron to passage. This rebirth of spring was more vibrant, more exuberant than any that had come before. It was as if the earth had celebrated the new balance that had been achieved, the harmony between the realms of the living and the dead. Animals, from the smallest creatures that burrowed in the earth to the great herds that roamed the plains, sensed the change. They emerged from their hiding places, their movements and songs, and to the symphony of ring Null that played across the land. Persephone, this return marked not just the change of seasons, but the dawn of a new era. Her journey from the depths of the underworld to the light of the world above was a symbol of hope, or a winder that, after a winter, we never are harsh, under the how harsh. Her presence among the living was a bridge between worlds, a connection that had been forged through struggle and sacrifice, through the breaking of chains and the challenging of fate. As she walked among the fields and forests, the people of the earth welcomed her with celebrations that lasted for days. Festivals were held in her honor, feasts were spread, and stories were told of the queen who had transformed the ender world and brought balance to the cycle of life and death. These celebrations were not just expressions of joy at the return of spring. 
but the acknowledgement of Percy from his role in the Rimen of the world. The goddess, though she walked in the world of the living, carried with her the wisdom of the underworld. He understood the value of rest of the fallow periods that are necessary for growth. She knew the importance of endings, for without them, there could be no new beginnings. And she brought this understanding to the earth, teaching its inhabitants to respect the cycles that govern all existence, to see the beauty in both life and death. Persephone's return to the surface, therefore, was more than a seasonal change. It was a reformation of life's enduring cycle, a celebration of the eternal dance between light and shadow, growth and rest. As the world around her bloomed with the joy of spring, Persephone stung the queen not just of the living, now of all that exists, a guardian of the bounds that sustains the cosmos. Then her, the dualities of existence found their harmony, and through her, the world was reborn, each spurring a testament to her journey, her struggles, and the power of a verminal, and the verdant embrace of spring. His Persephone walked the earth once more. A single flaw captured the essence of her journey and the victory of her rebellion. It was a simple bloom, yet it held within its petals the weight of new beginnings and the promise of enduring cycles. This flower, the first to bite through the soil at the dawn of the new era, became a symbol of the unity between the underworld and the world above a testament to the balance that had been achieved. The bloom was unlike any other. Its petals shimmered with an ethereal light, reflecting the things of both realms. It stood alone in a meadow, bathed in sunlight, drawing the attention of mortals and gods alike. To those who beheld it, the flower spoke of resilience, of the beauty that arises from the deepest darkness, and of the cycle of life that continues unbroken. This first bloom was Persephone saying to the world that the chains of the old order had been shattered. It was a declination that life and death are not opposites but complements, each giving meaning to the other. The flower resides delve deep into the earth, reaching towards the inner world. Well, its petals reached for the sky, embracing the warmth of the sun. As word of the first bloom spread, it inspired songs and stories that carried the message of Persephone's victory far and wide. People from distant lands wear pilgrimages to witness the marvel. And with each visitor, a story of the underworld's transformation, the gods is woven about his woven deep garnet of myth and legend. The first bloom was not just a sign of victory, but a beacon of hope. It reassured the world that even in the darkest times, growth and renewal are possible. It stood as a reminder of the power of courage and the strength that lies in the pursuit of balance and harmony. Persephone's rebellion, culminating in her ascent and the manifestation of the first bloom, heralded at the beginning of Uru Ara, an age where the end of white, the earth existed in harmony. Their circles intertwined in a den of dance of perpetual men with an Spring, once a fleeting whisper after the long silence of winter, returned to the world with a vibrancy that spoke of deeper, more profound changes. This new era was marked by a balance that extended beyond the seasons. 
influence in the lives of mortals and the divine alike. The underworld, once feared as the final destination of souls, was now understood to be a realm of transition, a place where endings give rise to new beginnings. This shift in perception changed the way the living being death and the dead, fostering deeper appreciation for the cycles that govern existence. The harmony between the realms brought about a renewed hope for the future. Cultures across the world celebrated the unity of life and death in their rituals and festivals, honoring Persephone as the embodiment of this balance. Temples were erected in her name, not just as the queen of the underworld, but as the guardian of life cycle, the goddess who walks between worlds. In this new era, the bonds between the realms were no longer chains but connections, it enriched both. The spirits of the underworld, under Persephone's, and Hades and Mice, carried their part in a cycle, their existence a reminder of the constant. The earth, in turn, flourished. Its seasons are reflection of the eternal dance between light and shadow, wrath and rest. Persephone's rebellion, light from a desire for freedom and change, had led to a world where the duality of existence was celebrated, where the changing of seasons was a reminder of the enduring cycle of life and death. Sprung, with its primitive renewal, became a symbol of hope, easily testament to the goddess's journey. And their vein was one of understanding and respect a time when the mysteries of life and death were embraced as part of the wondrous tapestry of existence. In this age, the underworld and the earth, Persephone, Hades, life and death, existed in harmony. Their unity a beacon of light for all who navigated the cycles of the world.